Hey y'all, Scott here. Here's how to support the show. Uh, Patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show if you want to donate per interview. Um, and also scotthorton.org slash donate. Uh, anyone who donates $20 gets a copy of the audiobook of Fool's Errand. Anyone who donates $50, that'll get you a signed copy of the paperback in the mail there. And anyone who donates $100 gets either a QR code commodity disc or... Or a lifetime subscription, now only for $100, not two, a lifetime subscription to Listen and Think audiobooks, uh, libertarian audiobooks, listenandthink.com there. So check out all that stuff. And of course, we take all your different digital currencies, especially Zencash and all the different kinds of Bitcoins and whatevers uh, are all there at scotthorton.org slash donate and um, uh, get the book Fool's Errand. Uh, and give it a good review on Amazon if you read it and you liked it, and review the show on uh, you know iTunes and Stitcher and that kind of thing if you want. All right, thanks. Sorry, I'm late. <gasps> I had to stop by the Wax Museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al Qaeda. Zawahiri is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. But we ain't killing their army, but we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben. Say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing the great Jason Ditz, managing news editor of antiwar.com. That's news.antiwar.com. He writes about everything that matters all day, every day at news.antiwar.com. Seriously, check it out. Uh, welcome back to the show. How's it going, Jason? I'm doing good, Scott. How are you? I'm doing good. Let's talk about Iraqi democracy. Um, first of all, uh, did I read the headline right that Muqtada al sadrs list is ahead in the elections? Uh, yeah, that's right. It's It's been incredible because everyone kind of took this election for granted that... Uh, you know, you have Iran and the U.S. pretty heavily behind the same block, mm -hmm. which is the victory block of Prime Minister Abadi. And everyone just kind of assumed, oh, well, he just won the ISIS war and he's doing pretty well and he should pretty easily retain the plurality mm -hmm. and then form a government. But... It really hasn't happened. In fact, uh, Abadi's block is is third place as of right now. Uh, we don't have final results yet, but they're getting beaten pretty badly. And Sadr, who historically has done just okay in the elections as a smaller block that either is a party to a coalition or a vocal opposition group, is overwhelmingly the majority in Baghdad and uh, is winning four provinces out of the 10 that are called so far and looks to be getting the plurality pretty handily if things stay the way they are. Yeah, which, um, oh, so he won't have a majority. He'll have a plurality because there are enough different factions. But then under the Constitution, he will have the first chance to form a new government then. Or not, not Sauter himself, but guys on his list, right? Right, right. Sadr isn't actually running for parliament, yeah. so he's. Uh, but effectively, it's him because they're all his allies, and well, he's, now was, was he's this an election involved. just of Iraqi Shia stan, or was this? Did they get to vote in Mosul, Ramadi, Fallujah as well? No this this appears to have been uh, an election that includes the. Uh, Sunni part of the country, unlike last time around. So uh, we don't really have 
most of the preliminary results are in the Shiite part of the country. Oh, so we sweet. Have... John Hagee's talking at the Israeli uh, embassy opening right now. Holy crap. They, oh, boy, okay. they, got, they brought the crazies out. Robert Jeffress and, uh, and good old Cornerstone Church Hagee there, man. All right, I'm sorry. I'm diverting from the point. Just goddamn CNN out of the corner of my eye. Iraqi election results, Horton. Pay attention. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Jason. Well, the uh, the Sunnis did vote. Uh, we don't really know how they voted. Largely, uh, it probably is going to be... Well, I, I, I hate to say it doesn't matter because, especially with Sadr, he tends not to have a great deal of support from the other Shiite blocs. So... A, a decent performing uh, outcome for, say, the uh, Alawis secular party or for the one of the Sunni blocs might make them part of a government. But, uh, of course, population-wise, they're just too small to, to make serious inroads into being... A um, um, plurality of any sort by themselves. Yeah. Now, so you you mentioned that um, the Iranians and the Americans both backed a body, the currently serving prime minister there, and uh, so I was wondering about uh, Maliki because he ain't dead and gone, right? Just pushed out, and so uh, what's his relationship with Iran like these days? What place did his group get? Uh, well, we don't know what place he's in. He's not in the top three. Because he has his own separate state of law party still, right? Right. Uh-huh. Right, because uh, Abadi was originally, you know, Abadi and, and the Dawa party were part of state of law because Maliki was a Dawa party leader before him. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, Maliki split and kind of envisioned himself making this miraculous comeback and becoming prime minister again, which uh, he retained some popularity right up until about a week before the election when the Grand Ayatollah Sistani made a, a very unusual move for him. He usually stays well clear of politics and he issued a statement through one of his aides just ripping Maliki. I mean, not not calling him out by name, but saying that, you know, oh, these politicians of the past that have already tried to unite Iraq and failed, we certainly don't want them to perform well in the election. And it, it looks like that's mm-hmm. pretty well killed his, uh, his candidacy. I mean, he... He'll probably get a few seats on his list, and he'll probably stay in Parliament, but I think the days days of Maliki ruling Iraq are probably over. Mm -hmm. Now, so, um, you know, I saw this, and I kind of was, well, I don't know, a, a little bit shocked and concerned, Jason, when I saw that Amiri's group is in second place. So that means that's not just a politician from the Supreme Islamic Council. That's the leader of the Bada Brigade. That's Mr. Power Drill himself there. Uh, and his group is in second. Is that right? Right. And and that's kind of a surprise, too, because a body had really tried to get anybody that was... Uh, sort of a leadership position in any of these militias, including the Bada Brigade, try to get them to step down from their positions to choose either one or the other, that they're either a militia leader or they're the, uh, they're the, uh, politician. But, uh, and, and some of them gave lip service to that, but, but largely they ignored him and uh, it, it appears not to have mattered to the voters that that Amiri is still right up there. 
And Amiri might be a more palatable candidate to both Iran and the U.S. than than Sadr is. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's the ultimate irony of this whole damn thing since 2003, Jason, right there, ain't it? That America prefers the Iranian-backed factions to the one Shiite leader who actually gives a damn about trying to get along with the Sunni Arabs in their defeat, even, and he helped defeat them. But... Uh, because he wants to limit the influence of Iran and America. And so America would instead subject the Iraqi people to greater Iranian influence, as long as it ain't that bastard Sadr who refuses to do like he's told. And whereas the Iranian-backed factions are always willing to split the difference and work with Iran and America. Uh, right. And, and uh, the U.S. government has tended to justify that in the past by just saying, Oh, uh, he's a Shiite, so he's uh, Iranian backed anyway, which isn't the case at all. I mean, he he's long been a thorn in the side of of Ayatollahs in both Iraq and Iran because his family is so wildly popular, and he he really does have a lot more influence than his rank would suggest as a cleric. Mm-hmm. Well, and so, um, you know, to go back, I mean, back if we go back to, say, 2005 and what have you, the controversy there was that he would denounce Skiri, or Iski now, or whatever, the, the Supreme Islamic Council and the Dawa Party, saying that because of their influence with Iran, or Iran's influence with them, that they want this strong federal system, as they called it, meaning take Baghdad, but then just you know, keep the south and east of the country and not really try too hard to dominate the west. Just cut them loose, basically. And then so, but we've seen what happened with that, <laughs> you know, after um, America and its allies helped to um, bring on the insurgency in Syria, how that um, that policy really backfired um on the Iraqi Shia for not on their the, the government there for not having the west of the country under control, leaving it wide open for the Islamic State to come and seize power there for three years. So, um, uh, you know, I was talking with Elijah Magnier, and he was saying, "Well, they've learned the lesson from that that no more of this strong federalism that they need. You know, they're going to have to do something to govern the West to prevent that from happening." But so then that raises the huge question of, you know, how in the world and and which Shia leaders are willing to actually treat the Sunnis with any fairness whatsoever. Uh, you know, it certainly wasn't Maliki, and I guess they say that Abadi hasn't been quite as bad as Maliki in his sectarianism, but then again, he led this massive war against Sunnistan in Iraq War Three against ISIS there. And, and then, ironically, it's this Shiite cleric, Sadr, who's kind of this working class kind of, uh, you know, tough guy, rather than one of these, you know, fine robes wearing, you know, Iranian-backed uh, scary guys. Um who seems like he probably is would be the most willing to try to come to a reasonable accommodation with them and has the you know could at least have the credibility to if he chose to or does have the credibility to if he chose to say to the Iraqi Shia that listen we got to do this and figure out a way to get along into the future and rather than just keep fighting and get away with that you know which clearly the at least in the past, the Dawa guys haven't wanted to do. So, I don't know, man. I'm actually a little bit hopeful about this. And, and you know, him and, I know you know, his death squads, um, you know, in the Mahdi army, they, you know, committed horrible war crimes along with the Bada Brigade in the sectarian cleansing of Baghdad uh, back during the worst of the surge and all of that. Um, but before and since then... Uh, he's at least made a lot of seemingly pretty sincere overtures to try to, uh, you know, make up and get along. So I don't know, man. Uh, obviously, I'm ranting and raving a lot on your interview there, but what do you think about all that? Well, I think you're right, but uh, my concern is that uh, the Shiites in general, the uh, the ones that were in the government before, uh, learned a lesson from the ISIS war, but they may have learned the wrong lesson. I, I mean, they did sort yeah. of leave 
the Sunni Arab part of the country alone to a point. But when ISIS was, uh, when ISIS really started making their inroads was when Maliki started launching crackdowns against uh, Sunni opposition because he didn't fulfill some of the power sharing agreements from two elections ago when he was supposed to be, uh, you know, two two elections ago was sort 2010, of, right? Right. Th- that was sort of the last gasp of. Well, in retrospect, the last gasp of the U.S.-Iran dictated Iraqi government. Maliki didn't perform that well at all in that election. Uh, Alawi performed much better. The uh, Supreme Islamic Council performed a lot better. Uh, But ultimately, you know, they had a few coalition talks that didn't accomplish much. And then the U S and, uh, Iran both just kind of got behind Maliki and said, well, everybody else fall in line. Maliki will, you know, decentralize power substantially from himself because a lot of the complaints about Maliki at the time were, well, he's, He's the prime minister, he's his own interior minister, and he's his own defense minister. So he's got full control, direct control of the military and all the security forces in the country. And he's he's basically running the country like a dictatorship. And the U.S. and Iran said, well, that, that'll stop uh, within a few months. Just fall in line behind him and he'll start divesting power. He'll give... Uh, the Sunni Arabs, some key posts in the government, and they'll give uh, the other parties key posts in the government. But he never did. And we started seeing uh, public protests, especially in the Sunni Arab cities. Uh, We had massacres in a couple of those cities when Maliki sent security forces there. And that brought it to the point where... uh, any central government presence in some of these cities, especially the ones in Anbar province, they, they were basically kicked out. And that that was really when ISIS went from being just a presence in those cities to effectively ruling them. Right. So I, I, I think the lesson should be that you can't, you can either rule those cities, uh, sort of nominally like like a lot of countries do with their tribal areas that they they're legally part of the country but they're really not Mm -hmm. or you can try to come up with some sort of uh more equitable arrangement but you really can't just take a part of the country that's you know almost a third of the population at least pre-war and say, oh, well, we're going to just rule this area with an iron fist and uh, any sign of resistance is going to be met with military force. It, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that's the thing, right? And and to think that, yeah, it's good old Muqtada, the leader of the Mahdi army, is going to be the guy who, who has the insight that, look, we're going to have to treat them fairly and have a kind of accommodation rather than just dominate. And, you know, it seems like, you know, the the Iraqi military and police forces, I don't know exactly their shape right now, but doesn't seem like in the years, you know, between the American withdrawal and the rise of Islamic State there that they really had the power, the ability to dominate those areas. You know, they nominal control was about the best that they could do, right? I mean, I guess I saw a thing... Uh, by David Enders about how they pretty much did have, you know, government control in Ramadi for a time, at least half of it or something. But, um, you know, I remember Patrick Coburn coming on the show a full year before the fall of Mosul saying that, yeah, all the Iraqi army soldiers, these Shiite soldiers, they're AWOL from their posts in Mosul. They're gone because they feel like they're way out on foreign territory. It's not Iraq. It's Sunni stand out there, whatever they call it. And that they didn't have, you know, um, reliable enough supply lines 
And so they were just saying, forget it, man, and, and retreating back behind Shiite lines and refusing to even show up for work there. So they already had the ghost soldiers problem in the first place. But these were the ones who were the actual soldiers were saying, forget this, man, I'm going to get killed out there. And we were turning around going home. So, you know, I don't know. I, and I guess so this gets us back to the election. And so what's going to happen here? Are the Iranians and the Americans going to conspire against Sadr? Or what do you think is going to go on? Well, I think they'll try, and uh, they they always try. But uh, we're going to have to see how this actually shakes out. We're supposed to get final results in the election sometime later today, and we'll see how close Sodder's list is to getting a majority by itself. I mean, no one no one's going to get a majority. That just doesn't happen in Iraq. But if they're close. They had they can probably cobble together a majority coalition just by uh, you know uh, offering some incentives to Sunni parties or secular parties or the Kurdish parties and come up with something and the ability of the U.S. and Iran to block that would be very limited if they need. Uh, one of the other two major parties, a body uh, party or the uh, Amiri list, uh, that that very well could be blocked, and you could see uh, Iran and the U.S. keeping the big Shiite parties away from Sadr to ensure that he can't come up with a majority government, and then hoping that one of the other two will get a shot at it. Hey, let me tell you about the sponsors of this show. First of all, Mike Swanson. He is the author of the great book, The War State, about the permanence of America's World War II military empire uh, through the Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy administrations, the rise of the new right military-industrial complex uh, after World War II, The War State by Mike Swanson, and also get his great investment advice to protect your financial future there at wallstreetwindow.com. He has a great understanding of what the hell is going on in these financial markets, wallstreetwindow.com. Unless I know he'll tell you, you got to have at least some of your savings. You must know. Uh, some of your savings, however much it is, you got to have metals. And so what you do is you go to Roberts and Roberts Brokerage Inc. Uh, gold, silver, platinum, palladium. Uh, they have a very small uh, brokerage fee in order to process for you and, and get you the very best deal. And if you buy with Bitcoin, there's no premium at all uh, for your purchases of gold, silver, platinum, palladium. So check those guys out. Roberts and Roberts Brokerage Inc. at rrbi.co. You ever play baseball? rrbi.co. Co. And uh, as I mentioned, Zencash is uh, a great new digital currency. It's also an encrypted method of um, uh, internet messaging and document transfer and all kinds of things uh, for your business, uh, for your secret conspiracies. Uh, Zencash.com. Check that out at zensystem.io. You can read all about how it works, uh, every last detail, of course, at zensystem.io. And then there's this book about how to run your technology business like a libertarian. It's called No Dev, No Ops, No IT. And each of those is one word, three words, you know, get it? Yeah. No Dev, No Ops, No IT. It's by Hussein Badakhchani, and it's about how to run your business right in a libertarian way. LibertyStickers.com um, and Tom Woods Liberty Classroom. If uh, you like learning things, I'll get a commission if you sign up uh, by way of the link on my website. And listen, if you want a new, and the reason my website is down is my own broken servers, uh, but if you want a new good-looking website like the one I do have when it's up and running at scotthorton.org, uh, then check out expanddesigns.com slash scott, expanddesigns.com slash scott, and you will save 500 bucks on your new website. All right, so then you want to talk about Palestine for a second here? Sure. Um, so what's what's the count right now for today's massacre? Uh, it's in the 40s last I saw. Yeah, oh, I see. Uh, top of the page right now at antiwar.com. 52 dead. 
More than 1,000 wounded. Um, I think 1,900 wounded, uh, Eric said. That doesn't necessarily yeah. mean shot, but tear gassed or whatever else. Hopefully not run over with bulldozers. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then it's also uh, this morning they did the ceremony for the um, unveiling of the American Embassy in Jerusalem. And it's Nakba Day. Can you believe it? <laughs> they they literally scheduled the thing for Nakba Day to unveil the embassy? I mean, I guess I shouldn't be too surprised. I wonder if that means that they didn't care at all, it didn't even occur to them, or that they were just like, yeah, exactly, let's rub their noses right in shit, you know? Well, I think that's really what it is, or what it boils down to as far as the whole rest of the world is concerned. From the U.S. perspective, I think it's, uh, you know, Nakba Day is also meant to be Israeli Independence Day. I mean, those... Oh, yeah. Okay, I guess it makes sense. I didn't think about it like that. Uh, I need another cup of coffee. (laughs) Those holidays don't always overlap because of different calendar systems, but uh, they're meant to be the same day. Mm Mm-hmm. And they're meant to represent the same thing. The Israeli independence and the expulsion of Arabs from a whole bunch of cities. But, uh... So I think from the U.S. perspective, it's not that they went, oh, Nakba Day, this will really stick it to them. They're saying, Mm -hmm. oh, well, this is Israeli Independence Day. We can, uh... Show solidarity with Israel and, uh... And I think to the extent that some U.S. officials may have been aware that, oh, this is also Nakba Day and it's going to look really bad, that they probably don't care. I mean, beyond the fact that it's probably going to make protests worse this year than usual and clearly already has because of the death toll, I think they see it as like, well... We're effectively on Israel's side in all this anyway, so where's the harm in just making that clear again? Yeah. Well, and so, you know, there are a lot of people who really don't understand this at all and put this in terms of like, well, you know, who's another country to tell us whether to have our capital in Washington, D.C. or in New York City or something like that? So explain, Jason. What's the big deal anyway? Well... It's sort of weird. Uh, Israel's capital was West Jerusalem when they declared independence, or Jerusalem, if if you want to just call it Jerusalem, because they did at the time. And it was accepted by a lot of countries, and there were embassies in Jerusalem, and it wasn't a big deal until 1967 when Israel conquered the West Bank and East Jerusalem and effectively annexed all this other territory into the city of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem since 67 has been growing pretty precipitously and pretty absurdly for what it is. I mean, you've got, you've got a very urban city that's been around for thousands of years and there's farmland that's not really anywhere near Jerusalem except as like a distant, distant suburb that suddenly Israel declares, oh, this is part of Jerusalem because Jerusalem is eternally ours and it's part of the annexed territory. So that's sort of their way of... uh, expanding their border is is to say well this is jerusalem now yeah and, and so and once they did that especially with the east palace or eastern jerusalem it angered a lot of countries because they're saying well you can't have your capital city be half occupied territory so a lot of countries at that point said, no, we're not going to recognize this as your capital city anymore, and we're going to move the embassies to Tel Aviv, which is why up until 
right now, all the embassies were in Tel Aviv. Yeah, you know, I saw this clip yesterday of an uh, interviewer, I don't know, on the BBC or something. No, it must not have been the BBC, because uh, they were talking with Norman Finkelstein. And I think this was just a, a pretty uh, typical type example, where the guy was talking about Jerusalem this, Jerusalem that. And Finkelstein says, just look at the way you frame this. It's pure Israeli propaganda. You know, East Jerusalem does not belong to Israel. According to all international law and all the different international court of justice rulings and this, that, and the other thing, and all along, East Jerusalem, um, you know, or as you said, since 67, is occupied territory. And so that's the significance here is that America is legitimizing this, you know, huge step because, of course, East Jerusalem's where all the religious sites and stuff are, too. So, for the, the Muslim holy sites are. And so, right. And, and it's not like they're literally building the embassies in East Jerusalem, of course. They're still building them in... Uh, they're, in symbolically, they're precluding the idea that the East Side is ever going to be the capital of an independent Palestine. They're putting that myth to bed, basically. Right. What it is. Right, and President Trump has said as much, that he's, while other administration officials have said, no, this, uh, the fact that we're moving our embassy doesn't have any legal ramifications for how we feel about final status. Trump has said in some of his complaints about the Palestinians not being for his peace uh, process, so like, hey, I took Jerusalem off the table to make this all easier and and he's argued that like and you guys still aren't coming to the table so you're just being mean when in reality i, I mean if he took it off the table in his own mind he just took it from the palestinians because it was a palestinian claim that he's suddenly saying doesn't matter wow i wonder he, he really is just completely confused, right? That's not just being cold. You know, that's being completely lost as to what the hell is going on around here. If he's going to categorize that as doing them a favor, right? That doesn't sound like, you know, Bill Clinton BS. That sounds like Trump just lost in a fog. Right. Jesus right. Christ. It's, it's, um, <laughs> he, he's envisioning himself at a business deal and this this is uh yeah but his map in his head is all wrong about who's doing what and where right like oh absolutely i mean he's he's got a very few he's got a very basic list of like oh here's what the palestinians want here's what the israelis want let's hammer out a deal like this was some sort of business arbitration yeah. and it's a big list, so he goes, well, Jerusalem's right up there, so let's just take that off the list, and it'll all work out. And the, the Palestinians aren't claiming East Jerusalem as their capital to be mean or to be difficult or because it's uh, an economic point for them. It's It's a historical claim that they have a lot of validity to and it's also you've got the holiest uh islamic site in israel slash palestine is right there so i, I mean this this transcends a business deal for them and and trump just doesn't get the idea that anything like this could transcend a business deal like that, uh, that a claim is more important than just oh well we can throw a little money their way or uh, promise them some aid and uh, that'll just gloss this this part over. Yeah, and by the way, before we begin, you can just forget about having <laughs> Jerusalem as your capital, so that way we don't have to bicker about that. We'll just be honest about one thing right up front here: this is going nowhere. So, yeah, well, good for him, Right, and, and the Trump administration, uh, we see this time and again with them when on those rare occasions when they engage in diplomacy. The, their offers are always economic-based, 
but they're also often very unrealistic. Uh, not to totally sidetrack the discussion, but Mike Pompeo's talk with North Korea is, well, if you give up your nuclear weapons, the United States will make you economically on par with South Korea. And that's, I, I find that pretty shocking that they would even suggest that they could do that, let alone believe they could do that. And Pompeo making the Sunday news circuit is saying, oh, well, there'll be no U.S. tax dollars involved in doing this. That he imagine, The administration imagines they can take impoverished, starving half the time North Korea, give them no money, and turn them into uh, an economic rival for one of the richest countries in, in the world as just preposterous. But that's that's the way they think. Well, at least it ain't Jeb or Hillary, right? Right. <laughs> I keep thinking that. I do mean it, but dang. <laughs> Does that right. have to be this clown? I don't know. And, and Hillary, we saw just uh, last week... Uh, talking declare about, war on china well she was critiquing trump and uh she was like well i disagree with him on iran and north korea and she's like well i wouldn't have pulled out of the iran deal but i sure wouldn't be talking with north korea effectively so it's like yeah uh we'd be picking a fight with north korea instead of iran that's that's funny I, did, I had missed that part of it. And then she was saying, yeah, no, China is the real menace. You know, I saw this article. Um, I guess I should have posted it on antiwar.com. Uh, Robert Blumen sent it to me. Uh, and it was Caitlin Johnstone. And she was, I guess, you know, basically it was a recap of her Twitter mentions. Not specifically, but just how things were going. And she was talking about how the, uh, the liberals are good on Iran and are condemning Trump for uh for uh, getting out of the iran deal and, and rationing up tensions with iran but then the conservatives interventions are good on syria and, and saying you know encouraging trump to back off assad and this kind of thing and she's saying you idiots this is uh, and of course supporting hawkishness on iran whereas and the liberals support hawkishness against assad because you know evil assad and russia and this and that so they're you know and and she's going it's the same damn war you idiots like how <laughs> How lost in partisanship can you people be? You know? It's crazy. You know, the only reason we're picking on Syria is because they're friends with Iran, okay? There, I added two plus two for you. Right, and that's uh, sort of... Well, I, I hate to say it's the most glaring uh, hypocrisy in U.S. foreign policy because that's a pretty long list. But... The difference between U.S. attitude towards Syria and the U.S. attitude towards Iraq is is incredible because they're both on the side of the Iranians. The U.S. tends to back the same groups the Iranians back in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw in the ISIS war, the U.S. backing Shiite militias that were fighting ISIS in Iraq. And then the minute they cross the border into Syria to fight ISIS there, then they become the enemy. Yep. It was really incredible. Hey, are the Hazaras, we back in Afghanistan, going to fight for Hezbollah in Syria and in, in, in Iran and Syria. Um, hey, I remember, and everybody check the archives. Go back to 2012, and there's me and Jason Ditz talking about this exact same phenomenon. Only in that case, it's Obama has given drones to Maliki to use to chase Al-Qaeda guys across the border, where they're bad guys in Iraq, but they're good guys when we get them to Syria. So they're fighting against the Shia-backed Assad regime there. Right. And, and what fun. That was before the rise of the Islamic State as even a state. That was what caused it. Right, and uh, it's it's a lesson never learned, and it's a policy that spanned administrations and never gets questioned. It's it's just America's stance on the uh, Iraq slash Syria region is that Iran is bad until you get to uh, the city of Bukamal along the Euphrates River, <laughs> and. Uh, 
then then the everything changes. You know, once you hit that border, then everything reverses. Crazy. All right, so um, well, you got a minute more. Let me ask you another thing. Sure. What's up with Israel bombing Syria all the time? Are they trying to start a war? Or they're what are they doing? You know, that was my initial assessment was that, yes, they were trying to start a war with Iran. Uh, Israeli military officials were saying time and again, whenever they would attack Syria, even though they wouldn't publicly admit that they just attacked Syria. Well, the targeting is against Iran. Iran's going to retaliate against Israel any minute now. And everyone needs to be ready for this big fight. And Iran wouldn't retaliate, so Israel would just keep sort of poking the hornet's nest until they finally said, well, 20 rockets got fired across what Israel terms the border, which really isn't the border with Syria. It's just the border between the Syrian Golan Heights and the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. But uh, they said, oh, this is Iran so then they started bombing even bigger targets in Syria, and they hit dozens of sites. And Iran insists it wasn't them. And Hezbollah has kind of suggested it was them, although they haven't completely confirmed that. So the my tendency is to think that this retaliation Israel finally got from Iran was actually just some Shiite militia. But yeah, I always wondered about that, whether Iran even went for it. Because I saw one statement where they said, shoot missiles? Hell, we're not even in Syria. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of funny because I guess I'm under, I, I, I don't really know for sure, but I'm under the impression that, yeah, they are in Syria. But I thought... You know, as far as playing things down, that's playing them all the way down there. Like, oh, yeah, we don't want to have a war with you. And certainly, like, what position could Iran possibly be in to have a war with Syria from, I mean, have a war with uh, Israel from Syria? I mean, (laughs) it's basically impossible. So they'd be crazy to go for it. It makes a lot more sense under the Israeli narrative than it does under the... uh under the uh, reality of the situation. Iran yeah. does have some military personnel in Syria. Officially, they're mostly or exclusively advisors, which is should be familiar to anyone watching what the U.S. does in these countries because they always present themselves as trainers and advisors too. Uh, certainly, some of these Iranian forces do get into combat once in a while, They try to stay back as best they can because they don't want to have big casualties reported in the media. But the Israeli position is, oh, Iran has 80,000 fighters in Syria, which is based on all these Hazaras and Hezbollah and all these Shiite militias from Iraq. We're just going to call them all Iranians because they're Shiites anyway. And then we'll say, oh, Iran has this huge Shiite force. In sort of Syria. like David Cameron's 70,000 mythical moderates out there fighting all comers. Right. They, they try to uh, simplify this, you know, boil it down to, you know, we, the West and, and Israel, no less than the West, don't really understand the difference between an Afghan Hazara fighting in Syria and, uh, someone from Najaf fighting in Syria and an Iranian soldier fighting in Syria. They just see Shiite and they see enemy. And trying to simplify an incredibly complex Syrian war means grouping a whole bunch of stuff together and calling it one thing. Yeah. 80,000 sounds high anyway, even if you count every Shia involved in that. Right, and, including and the prob- Syrian ones. I mean, right. Huh. That's probably how you get to eighty thousand. Is you go, oh well, you know, we've got civil defense forces that are, uh, you know, just Syrian Alawites protecting their own town that are t- have taken up arms to keep ISIS or whomever out, mm-hmm. and they're they're getting thrown into this as well. Then you might come up with eighty thousand, but. 
of course, these guys aren't going to go marching abroad into Israel or anything. That They're neither prepared for that, nor is there any ideological basis for any of them to do that. They're there to protect some Shiite cities and some uh, Shiite religious sites from Sunni takeover and in ISIS case outright desecration because if ISIS takes over an important Shiite holy site they're going to raise it to the ground alright so now what about um, the Americans and the Turks at Mombich <laughs> the Americans are embedded with the Kurds there the Turks invaded kicked them out of Afrin I guess in westernmost Syrian Kurdistan, right? But then started marching east, and that's the last I know, but that's a couple weeks back. Right, and and really it's it's more than a month back that they started making this march. And not a lot has changed. Uh, there's talk that Manbij is going to be resolved by the U.S. and Turkey somehow. Uh, Turkey's impression is that means the U.S. is going to kick the Kurds out somehow. Uh, the U.S., certainly has given no impression that they're even thinking of kicking the Kurds out, let alone that there are small number of troops embedded in a Kurdish held city would really be able to just expel the Kurds outright. Uh, but that sort of forestalled the fighting between Turkey and all these other NATO nations that have troops in Manbij. But, uh, Nothing's really been resolved, and they're just still kind of sitting there waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah, man. Well, so um, I thought that one was kind of funny where uh, I guess Erdogan asked Putin for permission. Like, hey, will you pull your planes back so I can attack these Kurds? And Putin was like, yeah, okay. Because what an easy way to pit the Americans against the Turks when really... You know, and and this is all the Americans doing in the first place, as we talked about, helping support the rise of ISIS in the first place. Then they had to fight this whole war against them, so they embedded with these Kurds and put themselves in this adversarial position against their Turkish allies. So all Putin has to do is just open up some airspace and just say, go ahead and not really do a thing, just let things come to a head there. So I guess let's hope it doesn't get worse. What a crazy right. policy, man bunch of madness all right well um geez am i hitting all the wars here there's there's some other wars but i'll let you go dude thank you jason sure thank you for having me appreciate it a lot uh that's the great jason ditz you guys he writes all day every day at news.antiwar.com he's the news editor there at antiwar.com and really on all the wars all day every day it's just great um it's the very best and you need it so go look at it, news.antiwar.com. And you guys know me, uh, scotthorton.org, libertarianinstitute.org, when they work. Antiwar.com, I'm the opinion editor there. And um, get my book, Fool's Aaron. It's on Amazon. You can get the audio book, too. It's read by me, Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And follow me on Twitter, at Scott Horton Show. Thanks.